would share with you just a thought or two. When I, when I heard Scout Sunday, I just immediately jumped to the Isaiah 40 passage, the one that most of you, at one point or another, at least heard, uh, but most of you have even memorized at points. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's just this great passage when you think about the goal of our scouting program. When you look at the flag, somewhere in there, there's probably an eagle. And I, I'm just curious how many eagle scouts we might have across the congregation. I know there's several. Uh, would, you, would you stand if you happen to be an, an eagle scout, adult or youth? Have you got a few out there? How about, now these are the ones, if you need a good turn done daily, these fellows will do it. They are so good. And I know David Miller has just walked in. I know David's an Eagle Scout. and It's just one of these great uh, pieces of life that you want on your resume. Uh, it, it says that you can follow through on a project. It says that you can work together as a team. It says that you have leadership possibilities. The, the goal is to be an, an Eagle Scout when you start. The hope is that this will become something of an Eagle Scout uh, troop where if you get started in it and if you just stay relatively involved then you can make it to be an Eagle Scout and it's a great thing to have as a part of your life story. We're grateful to our troop for that. What I'd like to do is expand it just a little bit and the, and the sermon boys is for you to a great degree but it's to all of us it's to all of us and the question is if I want to be an Eagle Scout not just in the Boy Scouts but I want to be an Eagle Scout in life. I want to be able to, to say, hey, I, I did the best. I got as far as I could in this life journey uh, as one of God's children trying to do the best that he could. How would I begin to get there? And Isaiah chapter 40 is just this wonderful, wonderful passage to help us do that. And sometimes I pick a passage and build a sermon around it, but if you do it right as a pastor, then you stay with the passage and you let the passage teach you and what I began to find out as I did the, what they call the exegesis, the background work, the historical work on this passage, Isaiah 40 starts a new chapter. They are in Babylon. They are in exile. It's hard times for these children of Israel. What, the way that they would diffuse the leadership and the power of a nation at that time, they would haul the leadership off to another place. They, they, they'd kind of spread it out. You keep them together and they're strong, but if you can just spread them out. And so they had taken the brightest and the best and they had taken them to Babylon. And in Psalms, you read a little passage, or it's around Psalm 137, somewhere in there, where it says that by the rivers of Babylon, we lay down and wept as we remembered Zion. The glory years, the, the time when things were going great, when the economy was up and, and we were making great strides as a, as a people along the way. But what I would do is, fellas, is I see within this passage uh, really three little points. Two of the points are what I would call grounding statements. You know, before you can jump, you got to have a, something to press against, something to push off of. you got to have some grounding elements in your life. And, and, but if two grounding elements and then one, I just call it a flight plan. Stay with the eagle analogy in that image. But the, the first grounding statement that you need to get right in order to go forward, and this is the one where it all starts, the first grounding statement is God is God. Not, not God is great, God is good. God is God. The heart of the Hebrew faith, the heart of our Judeo-Christian faith is that there's one God. They read a passage over and over again. It was a part of the synagogue worship. We talked about this two or three weeks ago about how there are different pieces of the synagogue worship. But the beginning part is you started off reading Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. And you shall love him. You shall worship him heart and with all your soul and with all your might. It's the grounding element. It's, that's where you start. Is God is God. In Isaiah 40, 21, we read the passage just a few moments ago. And remember, they're off in a faraway land. It's tough times. Well, what happens a lot of times to your faith when the going gets tough? 
as we begin to kind of moan and groan a little bit, the history of the nation of Israel included lots of murmuring, moaning and groaning. Oh, this is terrible times, but then it moves, when it moves from the moaning about it being terrible into moving into murmuring against God, that's, I think, what gets God's attention. And it's, it's sort of like spilling something gets mom's attention. It's not a good thing. It's not a good moment. But here's God responding to them with all these questions. Uh, have, have you not heard Jacob? He uses, it's like their pet name. It's like the family, the special name. Uh, it might be Bubba in your family or, or Trey when you might be a third in your family. Is it, it was like that. Jacob, have you not known? Have you been listening all this time? Have you sat in when they've read the Shema? The Lord God is one. God's going to be there. Have you forgotten about that along the way? Have you not heard the stories? Have you heard those stories before? And yet here you are when the pressure gets going, then you begin to fold under that pressure. And it would suggest that maybe you didn't get the first grounding statement down. God is God. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter who is in power in the government, if you're in Babylon or whether you're in Jerusalem. God is God. If you get that part right, you got a chance. Until you get that part right, though, you're going to be struggling along. There's a great article in Sports Illustrated. It's a feature on Joe Torrey's Yankee Years. The book that's just come out has made him a favorite with all the Yankees. If you're uh, familiar with it, it really hasn't. I always liked Joe Torrey. When I was growing up, he was actually with the Atlanta Braves for a little while, and then there came a point where he went other directions. But Joe Torrey, I've always felt, was a, a man of integrity and uh, character. I know his, his sister is a, is a nun, and you, you would hear uh, about things periodically, uh, about him going to see her to get a little inside help when it came World Series time. But one of the things that came out in his book was the way that his 12-year stint came to an end. Uh, it, it really wasn't a very honorable thing. Sure, there are times where people need to move on, even, even the greatest. There's a point where it's a natural time, but it was the way that it happened that became a struggle for him. Is there was a sense where they had stopped trusting him. And there was a point within a little conversation they had, I believe it was in Tampa, where they got together, and there were some of the younger Steinbrenners, and then there was George, the daddy, but he's kind of out of the loop now. Now it's been passed to, the mantle has been passed to this next generation, and they've already made up their mind before Joe even comes into the room. But he, in just a, a gentle way, the way he expresses it in the book, and, and I believe him, uh, but he, he walks in and he says, you know, we've been together for 12 years. Every year, we went to the postseason. Eight of those times, we, we won the, the uh, division series, which meant you got to go to the, the pennant race, the, the National League, or the, theirs with the American League. And, you know, six of the times out of 12 years, how many teams would love six out of 12 years to win the pennant? And, and, and he went on and he said, in four of those times, fully one-third of the years I've been here, we won the World Series. A 90% increase in attendance over the time that he's been there. Just the whole persona of the Yankees had come back after a lot of years of just mundane Yankee time. There have been times where they've been ahead. But I thought, what an interesting spirit that he brought into it. It was sort of similar, I think, to what God had brought to these children of Israel. Have you not known? Have you heard? You remember what we've been through together about passing through the Red Sea and Ten Commandments and all these miracles and smiting the Philistines and all this, and you've kind of lost track of it. First grounding statement, you've got it. God is good. The second grounding statement, you've got to get this one right too, or it won't work. The second, if you want to be an eagle, you've got to realize that we are not. That is, we are not God. God is God, and we are not. It seems so simple, doesn't it? But don't we get a little confused with that? I mean, all the way back to Adam, there was a struggle with, with knowing who was the boss. You've got one commandment, don't eat from the tree, and there he is already eating from the tree. He said, we struggle with this idea of us not being God, don't we? 